The eleventh experiment is called Beer's Law and Spectrophotometry. In this lab, imagine if you were ever to learn the easiest equation in chemistry. You will, this lab. And also, this lab uh, kind of teaches you how food coloring works. And that might be interesting, I hope. So, Beer's Law, I'll give you the equation in a minute says that absorbance is directly related to concentration, which makes total sense. The more stuff you have, the more light it absorbs, meaning if you have a little bit of food coloring in a glass of water, it's lightly colored. And if you have more food coloring in that glass of water, it's more darkly colored, although it's the same color. Okay? The light absorbed may not be in the visible region, we might be in the UV, we might be in the IR, but this experiment uses the visible region of the spectrum so they can use your spectrophotometers and compare it to the electronic one if you so desire. And uh, the key point is, although we have done it for you in this experiment, you need to choose a wavelength of light where your compound, where your stuff, absorbs light strongly. Yes, it will absorb more light, regardless of wavelength, uh, the more stuff you have. However, you might as well choose a wavelength where it really absorbs light so that electronically the instrument has something to look at. Uh, what I mean by that is if, if you have a compound that doesn't absorb very well at that particular wavelength, it's going to be hard for the instrument to detect when you have more stuff just because it doesn't really absorb light at that particular wavelength. So the copper sulfate that you're going to use in this lab, like the copper compound that you used in lab three, that lab comes up an awful lot, uh, is blue. It looks blue to your eye. Uh, the wavelength that you are going to use is 800 nanometers. Hmm. Why would that be? Well, visible light goes from 400 nanometers, blue wavelength of light, to 800 nanometers, red wavelength of light. So if something looks blue, that means it doesn't absorb blue light because the blue light is bouncing off of that thing and hitting you in the eyeball. If you were looking at a blue light, the blue light would be actually coming into your eye. But something that appears blue, right, a, a non-light emitting thing that looks blue, is reflecting light that it doesn't absorb back to your eye. And so our blue copper solution is absorbing not blue light, but the complementary. And so we set our spectrometers to be 800 nanometers uh, at the red end of the spectrum. Do keep in mind, this will help you in lecture, that short wavelengths, like 400 nanometers, are higher energy because energy is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by wavelength. So energy and wavelength are inversely related. The UV end of the spectrum is higher in energy than the infrared end of the spectrum. You can remember that because UV light will give you a sunburn, but infrared light will keep your hamburger warm. Here is the simplest equation in chemistry. Beer's law. The more you drink, the drunker you get? No. Uh, I mean, that's true, but that's not the Beer's law we're talking about. A equals ABC. Uh, sometimes it's written as A equals ELC, but the meanings of the variables in that order are still the same. The big A is absorbance. There are, for the only time in chemistry, no units. You could say that there are absorbance units, AU, uh, but it's still just a randomly uh, defined thing. The little a is a constant called the molar extinction coefficient. We don't need to worry about that. B is the distance that the light travels through the sample, and conveniently we use one centimeter sample holders. So a times b would just still be the same value as a. C will be the concentration, and we usually in chemistry use concentration in terms of molarity. Technically speaking, aside for a second, Beer's law is technically only valid for absorbance values between 0.2 and 0.8. If it's lower than 0.2, that means that your solution is too dilute and the spectrometer is going to have challenge uh, detecting the, the, the light through it. If it's too concentrated, then you're uh, going to get an absorbance value greater than 0.8, and that's when you start to get solute-solute interference. Uh, they are in, the solute particles interacting with each other, and it's messing with the light absorbance. However, that being said, uh, this lab routinely gives absorbance values out of that range, and it, the relationship still remains linear. A is still equal to ABC, even if A is out of range. So, thinking about that linear relationship, uh, what's the equation for a line? Y equals mx plus b. Uh, 
How does A equals ABC, Peter's Law, relate to Y equals MX plus B? The A is the Y. The M is the AB. The X is the concentration. And there is no plus B in Beer's Law because if you have no stuff, it should absorb no light. And so you would have a plus zero in Beer's Law. The B here and the B there are absolutely not the same thing. So if we use some known concentration solutions and measure their absorbance value, we should get a straight line of A versus C. We could then take a unknown concentration solution of the same stuff. Okay, you have to know what the stuff is, right? Uh, so if we have our calibration curve, it's called, we have a bunch of A values for a bunch of different concentrations of a known compound. And then we have that same known compound in a solution, but we don't know its concentration. Again, the dose makes the poison. We need to know the concentration of this stuff. We could put it in our spectrometer or spectrophotometer, your choice, measure its A value, and then just go to our straight line and see where does that A value, you know, what, what C does that correspond to? Okay, you cannot do this on an unknown. You have to know what the stuff is. You just can't necessarily, or if you don't know its concentration, this is a way of determining concentration. Okay, we're only using one solute in this lab. However, you could use it on a mixture so long as the absorbance of the compound that you're interested in isn't affected at all by the absorbance of the other compound that is contaminating it or that, is it, that it is mixed with. So that, that's an important caveat. Um, you also have to take into account that your sample holder, the thing that your sample is in, might absorb light at that wavelength. You've got to take that into account, subtract it out. It's kind of like tearing a balance. If you have a piece of weighing paper and you want to know how much the stuff on it weighs, well, maybe you weigh the weighing paper first and subtract it out, or you just put the paper on the balance, hit tear, zero, and then the balance think, thinks that the weighing paper doesn't weigh anything. It's the same thing here. We can hit zero uh, on our spectrometer with a with the sample holder in it, and then it won't count the sample holder. We could also, good idea, put the solvent that our compound of interest is in, in our sample holder, and zero that out too, because the solvent might also absorb at the wavelength that your solute uh, is absorbing. So that's what we will do. We'll have a tube, a sample holder of solvent, and we'll tear it out of our spectrometer. We'll set our spectrometer to zero. The sample holder and the, the solvent might actually absorb at that wavelength. Hopefully not strongly, but we're going to zero that out so that it doesn't affect our sample. The way that we're going to make our known concentrations is by doing something called serial dilution, and not breakfast serial, but serial like one thing after another. And so by measuring our original sample only one time, you, you're minimizing the potential for contamination. You could make all of these individual concentrations by taking some drops of your uh, solution that you start with and diluting it, and then taking more drops of your uh, starting solution and diluting that. You could do that a few times. Um, this is just considered a more valid method of generating solutions from uh, one single source. So what you're going to do is take 10 milliliters of your known concentration starting material, copper sulfate solution, and you'll put uh, 5 milliliters of it into a, a graduated cylinder, add enough water to go to the mark, which I'm not saying add 5 milliliters of water, okay? 1 plus 1 does not equal 2 necessarily when you're making solutions. You may get expansion or contraction when you add more solvent when you're doing your dilution. So you're going to add 5 milliliters of your copper sulfate solution and then add enough water to give you exactly 10 milliliters, the meniscus exactly on the 10 milliliter line. Then you'll pour that into a flask and you'll stir, 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 stir. Okay? Then you'll put 5 milliliters of that B, solution B into the graduated cylinder, fill it up to the mark with water, pour that into a C, stir, 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 stir. Take 5 milliliters of C, put it in a graduated cylinder, add enough water to get up to the 10 milliliter line, and dump that into uh, uh, flask D. Okay, So you will have undiluted stuff in flask A, you'll have it half diluted in flask B, you'll dilute it half again in flask, flask C, and you'll dilute it, ha dilute it half again in flask D. That will You'll only have touched the 0.1 molar copper sulfate solution one time at the very beginning. Take 10 milliliters of the stuff and then immediately put half of it uh, into a uh, 10 milliliter graduated cylinder, fill it to the mark with water.
Okay. So uh, this is uh, still one of the same kind of spectrometers that you're going to use to start with, but we have new computers that they plug into, but they're effectively the same. Take six of one or the other type of sample holder, which is called a cuvette. If you have the ones that have like a little H on it, you got to make sure that they point in the right direction. This way is one centimeter. This way is one third of a centimeter. You don't want that. You want the one centimeter direction. In this uh, spectrometer, the light goes left, right. There should be an arrow somewhere on yours or look in it and see where the light bulb is. If yours goes up, down, that's the direction that this would go. Right? In this one, it goes left, right, so you need to rotate this 90 degrees when you put it in. Of course, you'd have it upside down from this so that it actually would hold the liquid. Right? There's an open end on the bottom as I have it here. I was just showing it to you. Also, this cuvette here has a frosty side. These two sides that aren't shown are clear sides. That are the transparent sides. The light has to go through the transparent side of the square cuvettes. Some of the square cuvettes are transparent on all four sides. Great! Then it doesn't matter which way you put it in, but you need to make sure that if it has frosty sides and, and clear sides, that the clear side is where the path of the light is. Don't get your fingerprints all over the thing. Don't make sure that you wipe them off before you put it into the spectrometer. So, because anything that blocks light going across this thing is going to be considered by the computer as absorbance. And the only thing that you want the absorbance of is the absorbance of the copper sulfate and your unknown concentration copper sulfate. If the cuvette absorbs it because it's scratched, that's not good. If it absorbs because of a fingerprint on there, that's not good. If it absorbs because you put the frosted side of the cuvette instead of the clear side, that's not good. You have to make sure that the light can get through and is absorbed only by the blue copper sulfate in the solution. Very, very, very important. You will use a blank solvent only, and you're going to set the A value at that 800 nanometers. Uh, you're going to set the absorbance value to zero so that it's not absorbing anything. And then uh, that should be constant for all of your samples. We're not doing a step that we arguably could or should do called matching cuvettes, where you take all six of your cuvettes, fill them with water, and put them in the spectrometer and make sure they all read the same thing. You don't have to zero it, but you could zero it make sure they all read zero. Um, that's to make sure that the scratches on the cuvettes are all consistent and there are no fingerprints and stuff like that. We don't do that step. Um, we could. It doesn't take very long. We could do that, um, but we're not going to for this lab. Um, if you want to, you certainly can. Just drop all six cuvettes into the spectrometer one after the other to make sure they read reasonably the same number. Um, not necessarily a bad idea. The sample preparation takes a little while doing those A, B, C, and D for this lab, um, but the data collection takes 30 seconds. You put in sample A, you read your your absorbance value, you take it out. You put in sample B, you read the absorbance value, you take it out. It you can absolutely be done in under a minute in terms of your data acquisition. Uh, so you're going to do samples A, B, C, D, the blank, and your unknown. That's what the six cubets are for. Not in that order, right? You'll do blank, set it to zero, A, B, C, D, you're unknown. You could do those in any order you want, but uh, you want to keep track of what's what because they're all blue solutions. Now you can use your eyeball spectrometers and see how does your unknown compare to A, B, C, and D? Is it between A and B? Is it exactly the same as C? What does your unknown concentration look like when it's in the cuvette? Compare it to the other ones and then measure it in the spectrometer and see if you're right. I bet you will be. Your eyes are very, very, very good spectrometers. You will then plot your data using Excel. Being able to analyze data using an electronic tool is far, far, far better than graphing it by hand. Employers want you to be able to use Excel to analyze data. If you become a data scientist, uh, oftentimes that requires a PhD in physics, but uh, you can write your own paycheck pretty much. You can work for Wall Street, you can work for insurance companies, you can work for a friend of mine is a data scientist for Stanley Tools. And th when they recruited him away from Aetna, they asked him, how much do we need to pay you? Uh, what kind of computers do you want in your lab? Uh, we'll, we'll give you anything you want. 
not a bad position to be in. So you can plot it on paper if you want, but the skill to learn is Excel. You should know how to plot things and what looks right. Uh, that you have a title, that your axes are labeled. This will will end up being a nice, beautiful, straight line. It passes really, really, really close to zero. This is student data from one of my labs. And your R squared value tells you how close are these uh, blue dots to the line. Uh, 0.9999, uh, 1.000 is exactly on the line. Uh, 0.999 is pretty darn good. 0.98 you can get away with. Below that you really probably can't publish it if you were doing research and, and wanting to publish your data. So uh, the slope of this line, as we talked about before, will be AB. A versus C. So you're gonna find your unknown on here, go over to that uh, uh, line and then drop down and you'll find the concentration. Okay? Example. I think I have one in here. No, I don't. I thought I did. Let me go back for just a second and see. Ah, there we go. The animation was not in there. There we go. You'll let's say your absorbance of your unknown was almost 1.2. You would go over and then down, and your concentration would be really close to 0.09. I think that's almost exactly in the center there. Okay, that's what you're going to do. You're going to plot all of your known concentration values. Then see where your unknown is, track over and down, and that'll give you the concentration of your unknown once you've measured its absorbance. Things to think about. What would happen if an A value was off because your cuvette was scratched? Well, you probably would get an R squared that was not very, very, very good. Uh, maybe you want to repeat that particular concentration sample. There's really not much that can go wrong with this lab, honestly. Uh, mistakes are not valid sources of error. Data collection is incredibly quick, so if you need to repeat a data point, do it and uh, get good data so that you can find your concentration of your copper sulfate unknown concentration solution.